Hi, um, I'm Ming Fung, and I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at SIOC, and I would like to welcome all of our guest panelists to, um, to the school this evening. In 1948, Charles and Ray Eames proposed using then novel wartime technology for a mass-produced chair. The material was fiberglass, and the chair, as we all know, was the precursor of a flood of fiberglass lamps, chairs, and finally the 1953 Chevrolet Corvette, which was the first mass-produced fiberglass automobile. In the more than five decades since then, there have been only a handful of significant use of fiberglass in an architectural context. The Monsanto House of the Future erected at Disneyland in 1957, and James Sterling Olivetti Training Center at Hasselmere in Surrey, New, New, uh, England. In the ensuing years, a parade of architectural styles had one thing in common, the straight edge and the compass. Surfaces were flat and patterns tended towards the rectilinear. Saarinen's TWA building was an exception and it faced a barrage of criticism that challenged Saarinen's place in the Pantheon. That seemed to be that, until a new generation of architects, empowered with a new kit of tools, began to imagine form which demanded a radically different construction technology. Exotic materials became a hot topic. Latex, neoprene, EPDM, FPR, carbon fibers, joint production techniques, water jet, CNC, hydroforming, and plasma deposition as newcomers to the architect's logbook and forms which could be sprayed up, foamed up, sucked down, and carved began to appear in drawings and models. Tonight, we are beginning a series of presentations that will put these ideas to the theoretical and conceptual test. Our guests represent a vital cross-section of experimental architects whose exploration have helped to define the, the parameters of the materials culture which support these ideas. Form, technology, and tectonics will be addressed during the sessions, and I and all of you will be invited to participate with your questions and observation. We will start with an introduction by Marcelo Spina who did an extraordinary job to organize this conference. Thank you, Marcelo. To be followed by a presentation from our keynote speaker, Evan Douglas. And tomorrow, we will be continue with a full day of panel discussions with some of the most thought-provoking players in the field of architecture and design, engineering, and technology. I'm hoping that this session will form a platform for further discussion and activities on the web, in the studio, and of course, in practice. It is a great place to start, and the projects and proposition that you are about to hear should provide for an ex exciting challenge of ideas which, hopefully, will resonate long after this particular weekend. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the presentation.
Thank you, Ming, for the acknowledgement. Um, uh, good evening. My name is Marcelo Spina, and I'm um, Design and uh, Applied Studies faculty at SIARC. Um, thanks so much for coming tonight. It's Friday evening. It's, you know, it's probably a lot of other things to do, but, uh, but this will be an enjoyable uh, event. Um, I'll start with a formality. Uh, which are a series of acknowledgements. I know how tedious and boring this might seem for like the sort of overall and general crowd, but believe me, if you are on this side, uh, these are the people that makes this thing possible. Uh, otherwise, you know, we couldn't do it without them. So um, the lead sponsors for this conference, I want to acknowledge Cook Composites and Polymers and Krylers and Associates, uh, you can visit their information table that should be somewhere around here. Uh, sustaining pons sponsor Composite One, um, participating sponsors Olin, Solid Concepts, uh, Egro from Shanghai, uh, who have no representative here, but generously provides, uh, provides support for this conference, and Teijing Aramid. Uh, who are uh, the producers of uh, material called uh, Twaran. I also would like to use this opportunity to invite you all to walk around the building and see Sire for yourself, you know, as many of you that actually are uh, um, outsiders to the school. Um, this conference is taking place during Sire's open season career event, uh, where you can see the work of more than 30 students exhibited along uh, the north wall. Gallery. Uh, all of these students are actually in search of internships or jobs. Uh, it's a little bit of a bargain, I guess, but I have to do this. Uh, and job opportunities, so feel free to contact any of them directly or if you like uh, to get more information about their work. I was told to do that. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, second, I have a few more, so um, bear with me. Um, second, I'd like to thank all the speakers for this event. Many of them are here, many of them will be joining us later. Many of them friends, colleagues, collaborators, teachers, mentors, for accepting to participate in this event and for eagerly sharing their views and experience while engaging in discussion associated with the, with the conference. Uh, in the early stages of the planning for this conference and throughout the preparation, Bill Chrysler, personal input, um, generous enthusiasm and network was decisive to make this conference more focused and interconnected with the composite manufacturing industry. So, Bill, thank you. Uh, last, I would like to thank Ming Fan, uh, Sire Director of Academic Affairs, I think. I might get this wrong, but I don't know. It's such a new position that I might, <laughs> who supported this venture when it was just an idea and allowed it to have full institutional support uh, that needed. Um, last, the development of its attire, Bill Kramer and Don Moore especially made the, what was just an idea logistically and financially possible. So, um, so material beyond material, I mean, uh, what that's mean, or what's really the matter of, uh, with material. Um, material as, as a word and as a subject matter, and these are different things, it's been at the center of discussions within academic conference and books for almost a decade already. Um, however, it's used mean very, very different things in each of its takes. Uh, in most cases, referring to either the particularities of a material or a family of materials, uh, or in others, just specific qualities emerges from its use. Um, we live in an age of permanent mutation and continuous adaptation. Architecture is not exempt from that change. Uh, now, what if material itself will put, put into question? Uh, what if the very assumption of material as the purest, stable, and discrete property upon which we formulate, construct, often um, unstable things will become susceptible to change as well? Uh, traditionally understood as the stable unit for the assembly of form, what if material itself became already a form of assembly? Um, the relation between material and formal ethics, in fact, has been at the center of disciplinary discourse and discussion since the advent of modernism. One could not imagine discussing modernity without implicitly or explicitly referencing the experiential transparency of glass, clearly there are examples of this, uh, the structural slenderness of steel, or the expressive robustness of concrete. 
Nowadays, and since the end of modernism, this transparent and ethical relation of cause and effect between material and form does no longer hold. More recently, digital design and manufacturing technology have had profound effects on the discipline and practice of architecture. Widely known and accepted was architecture shift between, uh, from an interest in solid volumes uh, to that of complex topologies and surface articulation, and more fluid ways of integrating material form and tectonics. That contemporary ambition to liberate design from the old ethics and traditions of material constraints, tectonic assembly, or even on-site construction, instigated a widespread interest and appeal for composite construction within both the discipline and the practice of architecture. Conceptually, aligned, uh, conceptually and technically aligned, uh, or opposed, sorry, with the notion of tectonic implying the multiple and frequently mechanical assembly of discrete parts and certainly outside the encompassing axiom of truth to materials or truth of materials. Composites are for architects and designers with the synthetic and anisotropic qualities of plastics, plastic infinite versatility. Now, let me be a little bit specific here. And this is where, you know, it's going to turn even more geeky. Um, <laughs> Um, this is, could be in quotes because it's actually, you, you hear sometimes this uh, um, assertion um, that composites are poised to revolutionize the building industry by streamlining material production, construction, and assembly. Um, in fact, composites have the ability to absorb and subsume systems, you know, embedding discrete components within surfaces of variable thickness. They can think of, of the role on the role of finish, structure, and envelope in very synthetic ways. They can contain and enclose MAP components, move and adapt, transmit or reflect. Due to many of the above, composites require advanced tooling and intricate molding processes. Manufacturing processes such as automation or even robotics, as you will see, suggest that these processes will be made simpler and more readily available, one hopes, allowing architects to completely customize material and not only just use material. Composites also suggest a very different relation to time and procedure since they can be made in many steps, as connections, materials, sub-assemblies, or other components are added or embedded. FRP, GFRC, GRG, GFRP, GFRC, and so on and so forth. It looks like some kind of a, a criminal or government organization <laughs> to track people's lives, but these are actually materials, these are composites, uh, and they're all in the rubric of composites, making their use in design both flexible but also very demanding. Uh, so composite tectonics imply then a synthetic materiality and embedded forms of connection and assembly, different from mechanical assemblies, which confound not only the building code, but also the overwhelming majority of the building industry, and this is an important challenge ahead. The connections within composites are adhesive and organically molded in or built in. When it comes to materiality, their versatility lies in their capacity to produce highly synthetic qualities containing material microparticles inside of a resin matrix, as in the case of FRP, for instance, surfaces are able to both mimic and augment non-material finishes while also producing new hybrid qualities. So composites might not have a stable, quote-unquote, truth to their material consistency. Uh, in fact, their truth is malleable, and in their nature lays the potential for generating endless material character and effects. Whether these effects are real or fake is more a function of context than of substance. Uh, if one were to ask, following Kant's famous axiom, what does then a composite want to be? A provisional answer would be short and simple, manifold. Over what's the significance of composites in contemporary design? There are clearly fundamentally different and multiple approaches, most of which represented by the speakers uh, within this conference. So to conclude, um, to investigate the relationships that currently exist between technological advances in material innovation and the building industry and current discourse and pedagogy, we at SIRC are hosting Material Beyond Materials, uh, which is a sort of big title, and composite tectonics being the kind of specific of it, with the overt intention to explore new design agendas and research opportunities, hopefully arising from it, uh, resulting from the use of composite materials in architecture and other design fields. 
uh, one of the largest events that our school uh, has ever organized, and probably the first one with the direct emphasis on advanced material and tectonics, we're extremely pleased to host an extraordinary cast of speakers from all over the world and from across various fields. I, just a side note, I think there's probably one other thing that cuts across many of the speakers, which either they are um, uh, experts, um, racing, owning, or being part of a crew of a boat, uh, which in my case, I don't belong to any of that. Uh, if anything, I used to own a kayak back in Argentina, but that's really <laughs> side note. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we hope to this event will only be the first one of a series with the explicit mission to strengthen SciArc design ethos and its continued commitment to innovation within the discipline and practice of architecture, but more importantly, with, uh, within material culture at large. Thank you. So now the most important, the main course. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce Evan, Evan Douglas, who is our um, STEAM uh, keynote speaker tonight and for the whole conference. Evan is um, it's a friend and a mentor and, and probably one of the best teachers you know, I've ever uh, met and had. Um, Evan is the principal of Evan Douglas Studio, uh, an internationally renowned architecture and interdisciplinary design firm committed to innovative and contemporary design. The firm's unique cutting edge research into computer aided design, digital design and fabrication technology, new materials and multimedia installations as applied to a range of diverse gallery installations, commercial projects, and more recently, a new generation of building components has elicited international acclaim. Evan Eva is, um, is currently the dean of uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, known as RPI, and was formerly the chair of the undergraduate school of architecture at Pratt Institute in New York. Prior to this appointment, he was uh, an associate assistant professor at Columbia University School of Architecture and the director of Columbia's architecture galleries and a visiting professor at the Cooper Union and also at Sire not so long ago. Um, Evan's work has been included in various publications to mention a few, Sign of Surface, Index Architecture, the State of Architecture at the Beginning of 21st Century, and so on and so forth. Um, Evan's significant work as a teacher is contained in his recent book, Autogenic Structure, Autogenic structures, I'm sorry. Autogenic structures covers Evans' long commitment to teaching, innovative research, and sophisticated academic pedagogy, offering an alternative vision for the future of architecture, a timely and invaluable contribution to the debate concerning emerging structures and the next generation of building membranes in this era of extreme computational control. In the context of this conference, I will argue, Evans' work is central. Fluidly situated at the intersection of monolithic holes and manifold assemblies, his pursuit of tectonics of aggregation is not a reductive one, but one wherein the very units themselves are convoluted and liquid morphologies depicting intricate patterns, lush materialities, and vivid coloration, producing a world on themselves and defying the overall cohesion of the whole. Evans' work manages to be radical while maintaining a loose but fundamental alignment with the tectonic and tactile tradition of detail and craft. So it is a great pleasure to introduce Evan at Sire tonight. Evan, um, is, you know, if there's such a thing as teacher of teachers, we might be in presence of D1 uh, due to the influence his pedagogic work has had and continues to have on a whole generation of architects. So uh, please welcome Evan Douglas. And now I have to live up to that. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, let's get this. Well, first I, I should uh, thank Marcelo for the generous invitation. Uh, Ming uh, and Eric. Um, 
as someone who's been involved in academia for over 20 years, uh, SciArc is certainly one of the most incredible institutions in the world today and has been for, for many decades. Uh, it's a leader in innovation, uh, in experimentation, uh, in looking forward at new architecture in the 21st century, uh, at educating and challenging uh, the next generation of architects to, to take the kinds of risks uh, in terms of their imagination, uh, and certainly in terms of uh, the embodiment of their ideas uh, in, in real tangible schemas. Uh, and if we were to trace uh, the graduates from this school, they've had a huge impact on the world. So it's an honor to be here. Um, it's an appropriate uh, venue for uh, a conference on materials Material Beyond Materials. I think, it's a, I think it's a fantastic and enigmatic title because it's both uh, real, tangible, current, uh, but speaks about a kind of futuristic swerve. What could materials be and how might they spin out uh, uh, into the social domain? Um, in the context of uh, putting together a keynote address, it, it's a kind of an impossible task, but uh, it's an honor. Um, I've created a manifesto, and hopefully it's a conceptual frame uh, that serves as a valuable opening uh, in terms of uh, what will be, I think, uh, some incredible discourse, discussions in the next uh, 24 hours. So, uh, there are 10 topics in the manifesto, and then I will show some of my work. And the first one is in search of synthetic immortality. Uh, with the rise of interest surrounding emergent systems as the new organizational model for a planet undergoing continuous change, the opportunities to develop a more robust biomimetic approach in architecture are becoming increasingly more attractive. The once exotic, ineffable metamorphosis of the chameleon octopus, the otherworldly bioluminescence of the sea cucumber, and the strange gelatinous and reconfigurable anatomy of the comb jelly creature are no longer unobtainable effects underlying nature for the futurist at the turn of the century. The dazzling life of invertebrates is just one example of complex system of behavior innate to a family of living organisms that is currently being reassessed on a computational level in order to extract out the base code inherent to these uniquely divine creatures. Reconceptualizing the bridge between organic and inorganic systems as a transfer of essential genetic information is not an entirely new proposition in the history of the world. If one considers the exhaustive legacy of ancient and contemporary alchemists, in a variety of fields throughout time that sought through transmutation of matter, the creation of a parallel animistic universe, conceived as an extension of our timeless desire to bring inanimate material to life, this continuous trace, chase for synthetic immortality has preoccupied our imagination for centuries. Given our predisposition for even greater control over an ever-increasing complex universe, the next generation of animate assemblies within the discipline of architecture will inevitably be comprised of a more complex amalgamation of scripted equations capable of reenacting the most spectacular effects, harnessing the unlimited power of programming as a vast hereditary engine for emergent design. We will see an unmanageable increase in surface and behavioral variation on a level of intricacy and control unparalleled in the history of digital design. In the dream of recombinant technology and bio biologically mimetic surfaces, autogenic structures represents an alternative model of production seamlessly obedient to the process of modern strategy, situated somewhere between an indeterminate topology and a strange vehicle of desire, this seemingly lifelike fleet of new building components will represent an entirely new synthetic ecology, conceptualized as a new era of manufactured flesh. The architecture of the future will serve to highlight the endless algorithms of difference found in the indeterminacy of everyday life.
the infra-thin, the infra-thin at the turn of the century represents a new scale at which all emergent behavior as we know it will be reconceptualized and in turn be unleashed back into the world with the aim of a perfect future. Whether we're referring to the smallest increment of matter or on a genomic level or the underlying code regulating the building blocks and nanotechnology, this is the new battleground within which the future game of life will be played. Given this radical leap into a deep interiority as a means to reassess the underlying structure in all things, the project of the InfraThin proposes a kaleidoscopic explosion of surface development and material behavior for the next generation of architectural building components unprecedented throughout history. Digital alchemy, in an era of information where the dexterity of visual branding extends so effortlessly throughout the public domain, reaffirming the messages of persuasion of a capitalist agenda, digital alchemy represents a project of resistance where the computational power of the computer is skillfully mined and strategically aimed in favor of reaffirming the sustenance and memory of people and places. The claim for authenticity as an ethical imperative, novel effects, and sentient surprise. Mindful of an impressive legacy throughout the history of the world, beholden to a more spiritual and mystical conception of life, our current technological regime faces an extraordinary opportunity with its ever-expanding digital design and manufacturing prowess to reassess the proper recombinatory relationship between structure and ornament at the turn of the century. It's a compelling moment in architecture where the cultural imprint of a civilization can now slide seamlessly between meaning, memory, and matter. Dazzle topology. In appreciation of the value of the haptic in architecture, dazzle topology represents an invaluable source of insight identifying the retinal effects of intricacy and surface complexity. Seeking to elevate the status of the surface in architecture today is the new site of projected desire, understanding the relational correspondence between surface and seeing is a critical uh, arena of inquiry for all those committed to maximizing the full effects offered in this new era of topological expression. As example, uh, in the spirit of uh, uh, Hans Hoblein's legendary anamorph anamorphosis painting, The Ambassadors, one might reassess with our ever-increasing engine of computational power the role of illusory techniques today as an opportunity to achieve greater control over the conceptual and cinematic effects in architecture. Excitable matter, common to Greek and Judaic mythology, early science fiction novels and the writings found in magic realism in the turn of the century is a compelling desire to bring inanimate matter to life preoccupying the imagination of countless civilizations in the dream of synthetic immortality, where the material world that surrounds us obtains an air of excitability, self-determinism, and a range of performative attributes that radically changes our enduring sense of all living things as divine and absolute. Given our current efforts in the disciplines of material sciences, bioengineering, nanotechnology, and robotics, the next generation of material behavior in architecture will assume a level of intelligence and sentient superiority to rival the most spectacular fiction novels ever written. Perpetual desiring machines. At a time where the economy of desire continues to assert pressure globally on the rapid, rapid distribution of goods based upon the promise of novelty and surprise, Mass customization in architecture continues to represent an ideal response in favor of reaffirming heterogeneity for a multicultural planet in the turn of the century. Analogous to a perpetual desiring machine, the promise of infinite variation for a distributed model of interchangeable modular construction represents the perfect counterpoint to the slow yet determined eradication of difference often discovered in the wake of globalization. Although fundamentally different in terms of their unique cultural practices, M.C. Escher 
and Hans Belmar curiously share a similar vision of a world based upon an anagrammatic assembly. Here the continuous rearrangements of similar parts serve to perpetuate the illusion of infinity and erotic surprise. Biological mimesis. Given the most extraordinary secrets concerning the laws of nature and our very existence as a species among many can be found by looking more closely at the underlying behavior of the natural world as a complex ecology of seemingly indeterminate orbits of activity. At a time where we aspire to truly manifest emergent behavior in order to respond more effectively to the cultural and environmental aspirations of the 21st century, learning more about the elegantly designed life forms that share our planet represents an invaluable opportunity for the next generation of architects and bioengineers. Offered as an infinite archive of analogical models, Biomimicry represents a major paradigm shift that has the capacity to revolutionize the history of architecture as we know it. Intricacy, complex macrame, ornate scrolls, full body tattoos, Persian tiling and uh, calligraphic manuscripts, Russian nesting dolls and old Italian wood inlay music boxes, the pointillism paintings of Seurat, Damien Hirst's Diamond Skull, M.C. Escher's drawings, Louis Sullivan's ornamental embellishments, and the strange and beautifully eerie portraits of alternate realities by Max Ernst, all subscribe, as example, to an obsession with surface exuberance at the most intimate scale, seeking to imbue another level of chromatic and topological variation within the surfaces of real or imagined places represents a timeless project and one that has particular relevance for architecture in an era of digital and manufacturing control. Conjoined ideation. Given the increasing demands of our profession to manage an extensive number of interests, impacting the design, environmental, economic, and technological considerations facing architecture today, the autonomous model of architectural education is no longer adequate to successfully prepare our students to assume a future leadership role in a complex and highly competitive market. The daunting challenges we face at the turn of the century require an interdisciplinary response where a multiplicity of knowledge and expertise drawn from a variety of research streams beyond architecture is brought together as conjoined ideation in favor of new and innovative proposals. The distinct boundaries traditionally reaffirmed within architectural programs must be reconceptualized as an elastic constellation of collaborative arrangements mining the natural affinities within and beyond every academic institution. And the final one, uh, ethics and aesthetics. Architecture is situated at a unique moment in history where a convergence of global interests demands that our discipline responds in a critical and innovative manner. Faced with an ever-increasing focus on creating new forms of renewable energy, smart grids and coastal city solutions, sustainable and zero carbon technology and environmentally responsive buildings for the 21st century, we need to simultaneously reaffirm the ethical imperative to respond to these serious environmental priorities while at the same time aggressively advocating for the invaluable role of design. Given the recent surge to politicize the debate over green building as one exclusively bias to quantifiable data as the sole criteria of a successfully designed building, it is of enormous importance that our community of architects participate on the most proactive level to reassert the inextricable bond between ethics and aesthetics. Sustainability as a slogan and a detached focus of architectural productions threatens to oversimplify the larger challenge facing all of us at the turn of the century. The real project calls for radical innovation where the buildings of the future exemplify the full breadth of human creativity and ideation 
in order to celebrate on the most benevolent level the ethos of our diverse culture and community around the world in relation to a planet undergoing continuous change. So uh, with that, I will show um, a selection of projects uh, coming from my office over a number of years. And there's the, the, the menu page. And we start with uh, a project uh, some years ago, uh, Auto Braids. Uh, this was an installation, <laughs> an installation uh, for Jean Pouvet's work, first in the gallery at uh, Columbia University um, and also at uh, uh, in MOCA in LA. And it was uh, based on some of the things that uh, we spoke about in the manifesto, uh, certainly uh, in the context of desiring machines, would it be possible uh, to create a single unit that had enough intelligence that when multiplied, it was able to create uh, infinite variation? Uh, uh, certainly, I don't know if there's an answer to that, but I think it's, an it's, an, a, it's a relevant question in the 21st century and compelling to all of us that are interested uh, in seriality and in modular systems uh, in scripting, uh, whereby uh, a beginning origin is undergo able to undergo um, continuous change. Uh, in all of the projects, whenever possible, I'll show uh, shots of the manufacturing process, which I think is really uh, essential and, and certainly part of the sentiment and aspiration of this conference that that architects uh, move well beyond the computer and representational arenas and have access, direct access, to one-to-one -to -one, um, uh, areas of inquiry where the actual uh, uh, manufacturing process is being considered from day one. Uh, uh, this is certainly no longer a, a, uh, a radical machine as it may have been a decade or two before, a CNC milling machine. Uh, but what is interesting is that the, uh, the limits of, of each technology uh, uh, offer an enormous and invaluable amount of insight to the designer to um, kind of uh, uh, reinscribe those limits within the design process. Um, this is a, a, a shot of the single unit. It's a, it's, a, it's a simple fold that is mirrored across the axes and repeated um, through a series of physical uh, components. There were um, 16, uh, three and a half uh, uh, wide and, and, and 12 to 14 feet deep uh, CNC foam units with fiberglass resin shells on top of it, and it received 12 coats of automobile paint. Uh, most importantly uh, in this project was to set up a, a conversation with uh, Jean Pouvet's work. And I've always thought that the gallery and the museum are, although they're temporal in a, in a traditional sense, uh, they're, in quotes, not buildings, they're places of extreme experimentation. Uh, they reach an enormously large audience. Uh, they, can, uh, they can look back at history and turn it back on its side. I've never thought of history as being a, a linear trajectory, but one that uh, has an enormous number of orbits, and it's really based on all of us as curators at this mo moment of history to look or back and reread history in such a way that it's opportunistic and it's fresh. Uh, in the context of uh, Jean Pouvet's work, uh, it was always about a, a brilliant designer who understood quite well the manufacturing processes of aluminum, wood, and steel. Uh, and you could argue that the first script uh, for him was the cross-sectional profile of any of his uh, components, whether they reside at the scale of a building or furniture. Uh, and rather than um, reassume the iconography of Jean Pouvet, it seems to me you're looking, one should be looking at the kind of deeper ethos of the work. And in that context, uh, if Pouvet were living today, uh, he would probably be working with the most sophisticated technology available. Um, uh, I've always also thought of architecture not only in terms of uh, technique and effects, but uh, the way it's able to project and receive and uh, set up a kind of collaborative relationship with its recipients. That's uh, the, the kind of social and public domain. Uh, I'd like to think when I spoke about uh, uh, certain illusory techniques that architecture is always about theater. 
It's always about uh, uh, using one's imagination to make a new kind of place, uh, to challenge all of us uh, to be inspired uh, and uh, move away from the prosaic uh, world of the everyday. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the specific unit was created in uh, order to anticipate in aggregation that it was uh, uh, constantly in flux, it was moving, and that a spectator uh, in this room would in fact experience uh, a kind of uh, dynamism in juxtaposition to the artifacts of the collection. Uh, helioscopes, uh, Bill Chrysler is in this room, and, and, and Bill, uh, I, I owe an enormous amount of thanks for. We, we've spoken over the phone for about a decade. We've never met until today. Uh, and he's an extraordinary asset to our profession. And I have to personally thank him because uh, when we designed this uh, project and we were commissioned by the Frack Center, uh, this was a piece that was going to be in their permanent collection, which it is, full scale. Uh, there were very few fabricators out there today that I'm aware of that would be willing to take on the demands of the complexity of the surface. Uh, Helioscopes was uh, envisioning a world uh, if, if the Greeks built the world from the bottom up, that it was all about gravity and starting with a kind of horizon line, uh, what would architecture be in the 21st century? It would come from the sky down. It would be ethereal. It would be lightweight. Uh, it would um, materialize some of these, uh, uh, let's say, science fiction novels about uh, a kind of otherworldly condition. Uh, each of these helical tales uh, has an orifice. Uh, within it, a slot with an LCD screen, and it has the ability uh, to project uh, information of all uh, sorts, so it has a curatorial agenda behind the scenes. Uh, this is a reflected ceiling plan. Um, in this particular case, it was an experiment of looking at the helioscope as a kind of Siamese twin. Uh, what happens if both of the tails would begin to fuse? Uh, in the context of a module, um, could one obtain uh, a public space, uh, whether it's inside or outside, and these would be disseminated as a kind of uh, a cloud shroud. Uh, these are shots actually in, in Bill's shop. Uh, it was CNC milled uh, out of foam. Uh, there was, if I remember correctly, Bill, I think there was about a 15-piece fiberglass shell that was put together like a puzzle. Prior to the, you'll see a shot coming up, prior to the the foam, uh, prior to the, uh, the cladding of the mold, uh, there was a foil paper put on top of the, the foam, so there was a kind of uh, built-in release agent. Uh, and I've always found uh, an enormous uh, pleasure uh, in the process of making architecture. Uh, you know, uh, everyone in this room, the idea of sketching, whether it's analog or digital, uh, constitutes an affection for the evolution of how an idea moves from one arena to the next. Uh, and, and that's important that what you don't move to the final product, but recognize that along the way, there are certain decisions that have to be made uh, that could have a subtle or a significant effect. So I've always kept a kind of uh, uh, an archive uh, of the process. This is our Statue of Liberty shot. I, I don't know if he's still working for you, Bill. He is good. And this is the wireframe. It's, it's kind of interesting, and now I'm going to kind of date myself, coming out of uh, an educational system uh, in the uh, 80s, uh, where this is pre-computer, so don't laugh. Uh, there was an enormous uh, uh, effort on having to work through the kind of constructed nature uh, of the making of uh, the building itself. Um, it's incredible that at this moment in history, the wireframe, the kind of uh, uh, pre-assignment of material and surface effects holds an enormous amount of information uh, for the author. Uh, this is a shot of the helioscope as a single item. These are the final shots. Uh, it was shipped uh, to the East Coast uh, to a sports car automobile finisher. Uh, it was made as one continuous piece, although the, the, um, there's a retractable panel to get to the LCD screen in the center. Uh, interesting enough, uh, after all these years, we've got a client in uh, Abu Dhabi 
who's interested in, in mass producing this for a project, which is very exciting. Bill, I'll be back. And he's got the mold, which is really great. Uh, I should just say a, a few words because I don't want to go too far into it. Uh, in the, if one is attempting to uh, uh, propose that still life objects could appear to be uh, alive and have a kind of uh, animate sensibility, it, there's an enormous effort in trying to figure, move between the computational script uh, and the actual surface effects, and, and to what extent, uh, like the Wizard of Oz, are you giving uh, the secrets away, or is it able to sustain the imagination of the audience? Uh, in this particular case, you, you have the center line uh, that uh, controls and regulates the tail in its entirety, but you also have these kinds of folded pleats that are spiraling around that, so that for every increment that one moves in relation to the helioscope, it appears to constantly be changing. Uh, this is a project, uh, a reptile Japanese restaurant uh, in New York City, uh, and the client had seen our work um, and was interested in, in proposing that we design a custom tile system. Uh, it was uh, made out of liquid uh, uh, polymer, uh, cast in urethane flexible molds. Um, uh, it was uh, originally uh, created uh, using uh, animation software uh, and like a, a kind of uh, a jazz, an improvisational jazz score. Uh, one was looking at uh, the continuous juxtaposition between the smooth space and the pyramids. And the pyramids were chosen because they appeared to be the, the most um, efficient geometry to be able to create the greatest difference between light and shadow. The restaurant itself was uh, rather small in terms of its dimensions and the game had to be played uh, in the tile system. How could a tile element that's, uh, what is it, uh, six inches high, four inches deep and, and three feet long appear to be uh, undergoing a kind of evolutionary swirl as you move by it but also it had this kind of depth of field um, that was uh, significantly deeper uh, than it really was in full scale. It was through the effects of the surface. This is the, uh, the facade of the restaurant and these are quarter inch thick, uh, four inch deep uh, powder coated uh, plates, the three quarter inch uh, spacing. The whole mechanical system in the, in the kitchen was vented, both the intake and the outtake through this through the front facade so that there's a, a kind of clear juxtaposition uh, with respect to the syntax of the architecture, a kind of silence on the street um, in the city, a window that uh, attracts the clientele to move in, and then the kind of surprise as you get closer to the tile system itself. Uh, Floriflex uh, was part of a residency program uh, in uh, Holland, and they were, it was a competition to design the new brick uh, for the, um, the 21st century, and uh, they wanted to kind of, it, it's, a, um, it's a ceramic uh, uh, organization that's been in place for artists for a number of decades, but it, it appears that they felt as though, uh, as a common material, that architects weren't really kind of re-examining something that's been around such a long time in a new and fresh way. Uh, in the context of uh, our earlier work, the brick itself, uh, for me, would have to go a kind of undergo a continuous change in terms of your relation uh, frontally on axes where it's most transparent, and then on the oblique where it begins to take on uh, a certain degree of uh, opacity. Uh, this is entirely scripted, so you know it's it, as we all know, many of us in this room, there's a tremendous. Uh, kind of curve to get the archive together, uh, but one hopes that after it reaches a kind of critical stance that you're able to make uh, pretty rapid modifications that have significant effects. And I speak, I'm speaking directly to the flange system that runs around the perimeter of the ring here. The first generation of the floor flex uh, had a simple flange in four quadrants, and you'll see coming up that the next generation began to introduce successive flanges. 
Uh, it would be a much longer discussion to talk about the origin or associations uh, of the surface of this work. Uh, I certainly uh, think that, and I mentioned this in the earlier comments, that we live at a time where there can be a rather compelling and opportunistic conflation between structure and ornament. And that means that surfaces uh, in architecture can be doing, performing a multiplicity of interests simultaneously so that you can't easily delineate uh, between when one starts and the other one uh, begins. Uh, the first prototypes, uh, this was, uh, was made in slip casting. There was, I don't really have a great shot of this, but the, there was an incredible puzzle uh, necessary to be able to release the pieces, put them back together again, and pour the liquid clay inside. Uh, it was a two-piece system that got fused. Um, and here you're looking at uh, half of it in the kiln. Uh, certainly in the context of moving it into, uh, moving it forward as a product, uh, polymer would probably uh, be the material of choice. Um, and the, the, although the clay, uh, as ceramic as a material, I think, is enormously uh, interesting and has tremendous opportunities, both uh, common ceramic and industrial ceramic, I, I think in this particular case, the complexity of the surface uh, works much better for a different material. And this was a, uh, the second generation I was talking about. Uh, we were approached by MoMA uh, to propose within a limitation of uh, I believe it was 10 feet high and five feet wide, a modular system which would uh, represent a kind of new component for the 21st century. We took the floor flex and we proposed that it would have two layers of flanges and that they would be able to dilate uh, to a closed position and to one that was entirely open. I mean, I would argue that, that this is not only a, an image uh, of the scheme, but it represents as a, a kind of conceptual diagram of how one might envision uh, a particular future uh, of building components for the next century. And that is that, uh, as I spoke about earlier, that there would be a certain level of intelligence built into them so that they could undergo continuous change in relation to the environment. And that environment would both be the external environment outside the building and also uh, the kinds of activities and rituals that take place uh, inside. Uh, these are some oblique shots of, uh, of the double skin in that particular case. Uh, we move over to a project called the L Tower. We were approached by a developer in New York City, uh, the UPS building on the West Side uh, Highway a few years back. Uh, it's three blocks long and it's longer than the uh, Empire State Building. So it was a uh, incredibly uh, uh, monumental space and the idea uh, was that uh, the existing seven-story building would remain intact uh, and, and the developer in, uh, as part of a community of investors were proposing that there would be freestanding uh, commercial pavilions on the roof and they were looking for a open-air membrane as a kind of shroud that would move uh, horizontally across the top of the building and closing uh, all of these buildings, and at the same time, you'll see very shortly, move up into the vertical axes to encapsulate a, uh, a signature hotel. Um, I show this particular image because uh, from the start, uh, we were uh, conceptualizing the membrane as uh, first and foremost abiding by the efficiency of a diagrid, uh, so it would be the most efficient structurally and economically sound uh, geometry to be able to span the distances that we needed. And at the same time, there would be a kind of secondary flange that would be added to the diagrid that would perform uh, a series of um, interests, uh, part of them being uh, branding, uh, a decoration, a shadow theater, and a kind of microclimate. These are really experiments at looking at that surface and to what extent could it reach a certain level of excess where it closed itself up. Uh, it was a very fast project. We were working with Arup, uh, so we got through the first two rounds. Uh, this is a, the 3D print. Uh, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, 
Uh, this was the first scheme, uh, and you're looking at the roof uh, below over the pavilions, and the hotel is to your left. The hope is that you would have um, that the surface, as I mentioned before, would simultaneously uh, be uh, conceived to, to kind of regulate the microclimate uh, between the roof and the buildings proper, and at some moment it would turn in the vertical axis into the briselet. That's the existing building in the rectangle below. The cutout is a pass-through uh, going uh, from the west side to the east side. It went through a second version in, in terms of uh, reducing the price significantly. Uh, I think it was a $500 million project. This is now, uh, you're looking at the hotel that does not twist to the extent that the first version did, and it unzips itself at the corners, you can see the streets uh, where the buildings would be located inside. This is without any of the ornament, so we're really just looking at the pure structure. These were preliminary renderings of what it would be like inside. Of course, we, if the project had gone forward, uh, various architects would be hired to design the pavilions, and we really took on the kind of the urban shroud. Unfortunately, uh, the recession hit and uh, the project was put on hold. It, it certainly would have been a game changer in terms of uh, our office, but I also think that it represents a future in terms of uh, reconceptualizing New York City uh, in terms of roofscapes, that there's another, another level of occupation that I think would have a dramatic impact on moving the city forward uh, at this moment in history. Uh, just some quick shots. Uh, I'd mentioned earlier that that there's some work in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we were approached uh, by a client who's very interested in uh, this kind of weaving system uh, and is uh, has hired us to do a prototype. This is a 20-foot long, I suppose it's called a hanging column for now. Uh, it would be 3D printed and put together as sections, uh, but the larger aspiration is this is really a kind of test bed to begin to develop some components for a freestanding building. Uh, different clients, uh, same part of the world. Uh, we've been working with glass. It's, for me, it's been fantastic to be able to move uh, between sophisticated, uh, maybe more contemporary material and things that have been around a long time. And ultimately, it's not really the material, although each material has its own intrinsic properties. And you have to be able to understand that behavior in order to regulate it uh, in favor of your own interests. So we've been doing a lot of glass blowing in the last year and a half. And I think this came out of a, a restaurant, which I'll show you in a moment called Choice, um, and we, it's kind of spinned out into a series of products. Uh, some of them are being used with respect to immersive environments, and other ones are actually light fixtures. And in all the cases here, you're looking at uh, aircraft cable, working uh, with uh, metallic uh, injected uh, mirror on the inside, so you've got the simultaneity of, uh, the, color, the, of the color in the glass itself, uh, in juxtaposition to the mirrored surface. And we're, sorry. Uh, these are going to be, uh, there's going to be 500 of them, and they're going to be installed as a kind of topological shroud in a public space in Abu Dhabi. So we're in the process of accumulating uh, the units themselves and studying what that sur how that surface will behave. Uh, and uh, the last project is called Moon Jelly. Uh, it's a restaurant uh, in Brooklyn, New York. We were fortunate enough to get a LAAIA uh, um, People's Choice Award last year, which was a, a blast. Um, it's also based on a single uh, six-sided ceiling unit uh, that is mass produced, but there are specific uh, effects that are embedded within the topology of that surface that, uh, depending on where you're standing, uh, it's able to create a series uh, of effects that are constantly changing. Right now, you're looking at the reflected ceiling plan. There are three openings uh, in the tile. Uh, one receives 
the custom chandelier that we created. The other one is the sprinkler system, and the third one is the sound system. Uh, it's, it's cast in, in, in a thin shell polymer material, about a quarter inch thick. And these are shots uh, pre-finish. There were two tiles. The main one that you just saw is in the middle here, uh, and the periphery one uh, was created uh, as a transitional surface as it moves to the final boundary of the rectangle. Uh, of course, it could receive any finish. In the context of uh, this client, uh, this was a kind of French bistro. There was a, um, a desire from the start that the client wanted something that was both contemporary and old world. Uh, and although uh, all of our work, I'd like to think, is, is living in the 21st century or pointing to the future, it was an interesting challenge to be able to think uh, about something that had a kind of tainted, um, uh, how should I say it, a kind of uh, memory to it. So it was able to simultaneously recall the past, something Rococo, Baroque. It was, uh, there was an army of uh, mass production here it was quite a, it was quite an experience, and uh, um, the client was a trip. In any case, these are shots of of the pieces in different angles, and I'd like to think that that uh, the photography uh, that one acquires, it's like uh, beginning to move back into one's work and to revisit it in terms of potential futures. This may be an oblique view of uh, a modular tile. It could also be a view of, of approaching a kind of unknown city. Uh, this is a reflected ceiling plan. I had mentioned that the, the main tile was nested in the, in the center section where there was a kind of uh, improvisational uh, distribution of those chandelier lights and the flattened ornament, a kind of hyper sense of detail was used at the perimeter. Uh, this is a shot of the chandelier. Uh, the word moon jelly comes out of this notion that those orifices are able to kind of respond to some kind of emergent quality. Uh, this is amber glass. It's blown into uh, uh, music wire cages. And I have to say, in, in both cases of the glass work, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of iterations to be able to figure out how to tame glass. Uh, if anyone has worked with it, it wants to become platonic. It wants to create spheres. Uh, it certainly wants to assert a kind of natural tendency. And the great thing about all materials is really somehow uh, unleashing a certain latency within. These are some shots on the oblique. And in each of these cases, uh, it, as I mentioned before, it's about making theater. I think it's about uh, uh, changing the ethos of uh, public space, however, it, whether it's an interior, it's an installation that's temporary, or it's a building or a city. I think the obligation of, uh, of a great architect really is to be able to envision something that has an uh, enormous amount of provocation, brings a certain degree of pleasure, uh, does work on the most pragmatic level, uh, and uh, utilizes the technology uh, fabricational processes of one's time in the most innovative way. And uh, with that, I thank you very much. Is there questions? Any questions? I'm, I'm certainly open to answer them. Oh boy, the front row. Go ahead. You've covered a lot of territory in, in terms of uh, both manufacturing techniques and materials and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. And I think people would enjoy hearing your assessment of, you know, what are your faves? What are my what? Your faves. Oh, that's an LA expression. <laughs> uh, what are your favorites? You mean you mean in terms of examples of architecture? No, an example of 
which which is the most pliable, responsive uh, technology to realize whatever your vision is? Well, I you know I I think that uh, I have, and there are probably many in the room who who deal with the same challenges. D depending on the design uh, uh, of your work, on the most pragmatic level, you have to deal with something as simple as undercuts, right? And uh, the technology that is available to be able to move into those complex spaces is limited. So in, in, uh, there's a disproportionate number of projects uh, that I've had to utilize liquid material, uh, either as something that, that is, uh, is blown into, into certain kinds of forms, or it's poured into moles. Um, you know, what, what we don't speak about is the economics of a project. It, it's certainly a hugely important issue. And when I spoke uh, about modularity and mass customization, uh, certainly it's trying to figure out how do you uh, take, and I'm speaking to an audience that is, uh, resides within this brilliant creative uh, arena, how do they reconceptualize the world, not only as an idea and as an image, but actually move it into the marketplace? And inevitably, it's not just a matter of whether you can make it, uh, literally, using uh, a specific technological uh, engine, but whether there is an uh, economic engine to support that. Uh, and I'd like to think that um, it's, a, it's a kind of an odd thing for me to say because I. I certainly wasn't educated this way, and, and I taught at many institutions where the question of business uh, wasn't part of a curriculum. It, it, wa it wasn't a cool thing. Uh, but I really think that uh, if you really want to take on the demands of the world, that it's inevitable that there's got to be a business plan that is elegantly designed alongside uh, the most spectacular innovations. So I kind of move to the left on that. 